And welcome back to Jeff Kananga live on the road in Washington, D.C. What a guest. Tell you folks, when the man with the same name twice shows up, you know Miguna Miguna is unleashing without fear or favor. Miguna, a moment ago before the Unleashing truth. Truth. And there's no, nothing libelous here. No, truth frees you. But what boggles my mind is yes. that you said the handshake deal had been preconceived. It was preconceived. No, Miguna, uh, let me no, explain to you. Uh, no, let me explain to you because uh, I only use facts and logic, not emotion. And when you uh, uh, filter these facts, it points to that direction. Number one, Raila did not want to come to the swearing-in and only came at three o'clock when I had been left with the million people at the park and they feared I would take the people to a direction they would not be able to control. So they come to the park and I'll tell you, no arrangements had been made, even though we had said we were going to do the swearing yeah. in there. It looks very confusing. They didn't bring chairs. They didn't bring the platform. They didn't bring the emblem. They didn't bring anything. In fact, if I had not brought the oath itself, if I had not brought my seal, even a pen, it would not have been sworn in. And as we were sitting, a Bible I had chosen and had been kept at his house in Karin was not brought. Because remember, I had sworn him in two days before. We were supposed to, I was supposed to swear him in the same day with the same Bible, with the same pen. Because Jimmy Wanjigi had bought a pen he told me was worth 2,500 US dollars. Mm. All right? Yeah. So he said that was the pen we were supposed to use. It wasn't there, which means they were not ready for it. So anyway, they come. And there was no speech, by the way. Yes, and we had, I had drafted a speech that he told me to share with Dennis Onyango and Winnie, the daughter, so that they could print it, you know, format it and print it. He never read the, the speech. No. The speech would have given the youth particularly a way forward so that we would have known what to do. The idea was originally, we were not going to leave the park. We were not supposed to go to State House. That was a lie. We were supposed to stay at the park peacefully and hold a carnival protest for as long as it took until Uru surrendered. Huh? But Trailau ran away within five minutes. It did not even take five minutes. He ran away, literally. I had to jump into Winnie's vehicle to be able to find myself in Karen. And as you could see from photos, and they are here, mm. from up, uh, uh, after the event, yes. it was just myself, Orango, Jimmy, uh, Aida, Raila, Malala, and Haniri. Nobody else was there. So these people were saying, Kajuang swore Raila, where is he? But the handshake, I, yes. I'm still boggled by this. Yes. They had prearranged it? They had prearranged it. Why is it that I'm arrested and charged with treason and detained in Comunicado and not released despite 15 court orders? But Raila, whom is the one? who had taken the oath, because I only administered the oath. Yeah. The owner of the oath, the one who took it, is Raila Odinga. So you, were, you suddenly had become a threat? Or so was I was a threat directly to both Uhuru and Raila Odinga. Raila Odinga because he felt that even if he became president, you know, it's like the kingmaker. He, he would immediately have to deal with the kingmaker. Mm -hmm. But because now he was not going to be president because he had already surrendered, he felt the succession issue within his constituency was a foregone conclusion. That is a fact. That Miguna was his apparent or heir apparent? That is what he thought. And he now had to cut my legs. In fact, not just cut my legs, cut my head off. Speaking of which, two days later, they attacked my home. And that day they attacked, Raila and Jimmy Wanjigi had promised to deliver four million Kenya shillings for work that I was going to start. Instead of them delivering the money, the police broke my day using explosives. If you recall, I'm a member of the Law Society of Kenya. The Law Society has done nothing. I'm not saying he has power over the Law Society, but he has a lot of influence over some of the lawyers that were acting for me. Mm -hmm. 
They have done absolutely nothing to try to enforce the order. But you got your passport back, according to I the High Court. I never got the passport. Okay, they, they ruled you get your passport back. But I never got the passport. Physically? If, if they were to give me the passport, I would be home by weekend. This weekend. Come on. Yes. Why can't you get it? On, Jeff, on... I, would, I, would board the, I would go to Toronto to say goodbye to my children and my wife. And I would board the plane before Friday. So you would be boarding? I would be in Kenya. Do you understand? But and I came to Kenya on March 26th, and you saw what they did. I saw, I saw what so they... what I'm trying to tell you is this. It's not because I don't want to come. It's because they did what they did. They tortured me in a manner that is indescribable. Let's go back to that now. Right. The, the, the part I don't understand is they took you all around. They were driving you all over, and you ended up in a place in, called Lari. Now, what happened is this. When they took me from my house, about 8 o'clock, by the way, they didn't find me until about 8 o'clock. From 5? From 5.30. So they are rummaging through the house, destroying things, looking for things, probably looking uh, for places they can um, uh, hide things they want to, to plant there. I don't know. Mm. But they spent quite a bit of time inside my house. Whatever they were doing, I don't know. They eventually break the door. Five guns blazing into the room. Guns drawn. Five of them jumped into the room. Two with a pistol, three with AK-47. All right? Are they all plain clothes? All plain clothes. Nobody wore a police uniform. And there was no police vehicle with an emblem written police. Nobody shouted police when they broke in. And they later on told me, that they had no capacity to explode, to, to use explosives into the house. That only two groups has. The Reke squad, which is the presidential elite, you know, bodyguard squad, and the military. And they say the military were not at my house. So it was the Reke squad that guards the president. I had been anticipating this attack. So I had drafted a text message to go out as an alert to all media, uh, you know, houses. all media houses, all journalists, yeah. all reporters that I knew, both abroad and in Kenya, and to lawyers and to organizations. The moment I had the explosion, I grabbed my phone and pressed send. All right? Yeah. The moment that went out, it was on social media, it was in the media, uh, it was uh, with the NRM people, they were making noise, the neighbors were making noise like crazy. So I think it became inconvenient. But the idea was to abduct me, and had they abducted me without anybody knowing, and people discovered hours or days later that I was missing, I would have been killed just like Musando. Okay, so six days of hell followed. Yes. Right? Yes. In the end, you end up in a court in Kajiado. So what happened is that they first took me to Kiambu. Yes. So I asked them, why are you going to Kiambu? I mean, you should be going to the CID headquarters or take me to a Nairobi police station, Runda police station, because I live in Nairobi. Yeah. And they threatened me. So I kept quiet. I tried to call Orang on the phone. They grabbed the phone. And they took the phone away. I never had my phone back until when they were putting me in the plane on uh, February the 6th. So they take me to Kiambu police station. They put me in a vehicle. They go inside. Two of them remained with me. They are armed to the teeth. And uh, they stayed there for a while. Then they came out. They got into the vehicle. They drove off. And I see them heading towards Gidunguri. I know Central Province very well. I went to Central Province. Uh, I went to A-levels in Central Province. So I tell them, why are you going to Gidunguri? And the guy who was sitting to my left, he was very vicious. He said they should blindfold me if I know too much about where I'm going. Something to that effect. So, and that I should not say anything. So of course I kept quiet. I knew we were going to Gidunguri. And so things started, you know, forming in my mind because I had taken two of my passports, the Kenyan passport and the Canadian passport. The idea was, if I felt like they were going to kill me, I would throw them through the window so that somebody, uh, in the commotion, so that later on probably somebody would find them 
and know the route they took. That's why I carried my passports. So where did you end up? So I end up in Gidunguri. They lock me up there. And uh, they're not telling me anything. They're not telling me a number, I'm under arrest. They're not reading my, me my rights. They're not giving me access to a lawyer. They're not giving me access to my family. They basically just lock me in and forgot about me. They didn't give me even water, no food, nothing. So in the evening, um, the NRM people came to Gidunguri. For some reason, they knew. And the press and a few of my friends and lawyers. So I was called and I came outside. And I saw um, Waikwa Wanyoike. I saw somebody called Kamau Ngugi, he's a human rights defender. Uh, I saw the Secretary General for ODM, Sefona. I saw this guy called Otieno, the lawyer for uh, Wanjigi. He was constantly on the phone, updating Raila and uh, the group. And he was not really talking to me. So when we went in, they told me they already got an order for my release and that I would be released. So I felt relieved. For the first time, they brought me food, okay? So they bought food, they bought a drink, and I ate food. I felt very uh, upset when Sefuna was now trying to make it look like eating is a privilege. I had not eaten since 5.30. I did not eat breakfast. I did not eat lunch. Yeah. It was now going to six. And Waikwa Wanyoike bought food for me. And he says ODM bought food for me, that they bought chicken uh, chips, chicken and chips. So what if they brought chicken and chips? So what happened then? So at 10 o'clock that night, the, the same people who had abducted me came and told me to leave with them. They put me in a vehicle and drove into the night and would drive, stop, drive, stop. That's when I really thought now, this one is over. Eventually, we end up in Larry at the Larry police station. So I was not killed. <laughs> we end up at the Larry police station. Yes. And they lock me up under the most horrendous conditions imaginable. I stood for hours on end for more than a day. Why? Because there was no chair and no place to sit or sleep. And it was thinking. And that room, the space where they put me, they had locked up another a woman who, when I found out from her that she had been beaten by her husband, but they lock her up at the police station in a cell. I mean, what is this? Your husband beats you, but instead of arresting the husband who was beaten at the woman, they lock the woman up in the police station with a political detainee. Right, yes, yeah. <laughs> so anyway, they locked me up there. Then they moved the woman to the room to the right. There were three rooms. The corridor where I was standing, the room to the left where there were a number of youth that had been detained there, and then the one to the right. Eventually, the woman moves to the right after hours and hours of her sleeping on the floor. And they would not open the door for this woman so that she could go to the toilet. Mm. A pit latrine smelling inside there. Mm. She released herself inside the room. It was thinking crazy. In that room? In that room. So the following day, they made her to wash that room and then transferred me into the room and moved her to the corridor where I was. My friend, there was no chair, nothing to sit on, nothing to sleep on, no blanket, no sheet, no toilet paper. I slept on the real bare concrete. My shoes were now supposed to be my pillow. At one point, I had my, to, release, to relieve myself inside the room because they would not open. And then on the fifth day is when they took me away from there. Having told the press they were leaving from the front, they brought the vehicle from the back put me there, put sirens going to the front. The media and maybe you guys already knew that that is just a decoy. Mm. You chased that one to Nairobi oh. when I'm being taken a different direction. To Kajiado? No, they didn't take me to Kajiado. 
So they took me through Kiambu uh, to Ruiru. We ended up at the inland depot, the police station at the inland depot uh, in uh, Embakasi. And I was detained there overnight. That is the only decent place I stayed. Still on the floor, but there was a small mattress on the floor for the first time. And there was water to wash my face. And there was uh, a toilet I could go to. And they gave me food for the first time. In five days? Yes. The sixth day, they came very early in the morning, took me and took to Mombasa Road. And I ended up in Kajiado. In, after Kajiado, what, what was the ruling? Mulochi, the magistrate, said he could not. I mean, a court order from the high court could not be varied or set aside or amended by a magistrate. They had put this magistrate in a terrible position. Because Justice Luka Kimaru, Justice Wakiaga, Justice uh, Ochacha Mweta had already ordered that I should be released and they had refused. So he said, take him to Nairobi within, by, by three o'clock. Instead, they took off towards Nairobi following the same route they had taken to bring me and erected roadblocks here and there through tear gas at the NRM people who were chasing after them. And at some point, they decided they were turning back, coming back to Kajiado. They are not going anymore. And they ended up going through the National Park, the Nairobi National Park, mm -hmm. towards um, Ongata Rongai, and went through the bypass, back to Mombasa Road, back to the Inland Depot. At the Inland Depot, they wrestled me to the ground, searched uh, my pocket everywhere, took the Kenyan passport, took the Canadian passport, put me in a vehicle to the airport. JKIA. JKIA. They had decided to And kept me right there at the, at the runway for six hours. In the car? Until midnight. In a car? Yes. Surrounded by armed uh, police officers. In the car? In the car. Facilitated by Kenya airport authorities. But at some point, Raila came to the airport. No, this Jimmy was the, no, 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 you are mixing the two. Uh. This is the 6th of February. Oh, this is the first time the first they removed deportation. me. It is not a deportation. Let me educate you a little bit, my brother. A deportation is a legal judicial process where you are given notice. Even people who have been abroad here, they know. If you are being deported, the authorities give you notice, give you the allegations, they tell you you have a right to a lawyer and to present your case, you go before a tribunal, they say we want to remove him because of one, two, three, the tribunal decides whether that is legitimate or not and gives an order of deportation. I didn't go through that. No. On the contrary, the court had ruled that I should be released. Okay, so let's come so, back to this. So, so I'm being taken to the airport. You're sitting in the car. I'm sitting in the car until midnight. KLM. KLM. Then they take me to KLM and they want me to board, I think, before anybody else. And the KLM refuse. And they tell them to take me back. I don't know what it was, uh, but they refused. Mm. I didn't go through security. I didn't go through immigration or customs. So this idea that people say, you must go through immigration, you must go through. I was never processed through immigration or customs on the 6th of February. But do you get on the plane eventually? Yes, but I get uh, to the plane from the runway. Correct, you walk up the stairs. So that means that I can even return to Kenya through the runway, not through immigration <laughs> or customs. Okay. Anyway. Do they escort you in? So they do. And many of them with guns. Do they escort you to Amsterdam? They did. They put me in the plane, but they have, of course, uh, plain clothes people mm -hmm. sitting there. I was not handcuffed or anything. No. You were like any so, other passenger. Yeah, so when we arrive, they give them my documents. They never gave me the, the, the passport. They didn't give me the ticket. No. They didn't give me the boarding pass. So everything had already been predetermined. And I think they wanted to cook up something because when I arrived at Amsterdam, the Netherlands police or Amsterdam police met me at the plane. And they said that they have to go with me because they have questions. So we went. And, you know, these people are not as, as sophisticated as they think uh, they are. So we go there. Within 30 minutes, 
they said these guys are jokers. <laughs> I mean, they said, you mean Kenya is a criminal state? No. Why would they bring you like this and say that you have a case? There's no case here. What is it? My friend, good luck. Bye-bye. Yeah, the ones who brought you here are the criminals. <laughs> So I went, yes. I didn't have money. No. Remember, I had Kenya shillings. Yes. My wallet, everything else had remained in Nairobi. You have nothing on you. I have nothing on me and the flight is leaving, I don't know how many hours. Luckily, being a good person is a good thing. Yes. I hear a call from behind huh? and I turn huh? and it's my old client. <laughs> <laughs> At the airport. At the airport. Yes. She's going to the US. And uh, these are people I had helped many years mm. in Toronto. Uh, you know, I represented yes. them and they got papers yes. and whatnot. She's the one who entertained me the whole day until I boarded. She's also the one who put me through to Apple Lomboya, who the BBC had called, wanted an interview. Yes. And I did the interview at Amsterdam before I arrived in Toronto. That's how come when I arrived at the airport, people met me at the Correct. airport. Because people did not know that I was going. I remember. Yes. My goodness, that was... <laughs> that was the first one. First one. Yes. We're going to take a break, come yes. back and talk about the second one, which I filmed on the plane. Thank you. Remember that one? I remember. I... When you were acting for the state. I was not, because <laughs> I was not. <laughs> I just happened to be on that well, flight. There are no coincidences in politics. <laughs> or in life. Yes. Remember? <laughs> no. The only coincidence yes. in politics is the one that has been made, okay? Yeah, it's been intentionally yes. created. Yes. Yeah, so there is none. <laughs> <laughs> Miguna, Miguna, folks. No wonder he has the same name twice. Keep tweeting. This is a special. Jeff Kunange live on the road in Washington, D.C. Twitter handles, at Kunange Jeff, at Citizen TV Kenya. Hashtag, as always, is JK Live. JK Live takes a break. We'll be back. In a moment. <laughs>